Welcome to the Mavens Do It Better podcast. And now, your host, Heather Newman. Hello, everyone. Today's guest I am super excited about. His name is Richard Campbell, and he and I have swapped pods a couple of times. Richard is fabulous, and he is the host of a wonderful podcast called Run As Radio. Richard has been doing that podcast, no kidding, since uh, 2007, and uh, it was launched in conjunction with a sister podcast called .NET Rocks. So I would highly recommend you followed Richard's podcast. We always have great things to talk about. His podcast is weekly, and it's for IT professionals working on Microsoft products. I'm very excited about our conversation that we had. It's always fun to swap pods with Richard. So I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. Here we are again for another episode of the Mavens Do It Better podcast, where we interview extraordinary experts that bring a light to our world. And I am on with someone today who definitely brings a light to the world, a light to my world for sure. Um, And yes, absolutely. Richard Campbell, star host of Run As Radio. Hello, Richard. Hi, friend. How are you? (laughs) I'm good, friend. How are you? (laughs) Good, good, good. I feel like we just did this because we did on my show. We did. Last week, I know we did it. We we did swapsies, as they say on the pods. Yes. So I was like, you know. right on. But yeah, I it was that was so fun. I love being on your show. That was my second time. So thank you. Yeah, for we had a lot of. We do have a lot of fun and and a lot of uh, pre roll and post roll too. Yeah, right. It's like I think we just like talking to each other. And so. I think. Absolutely. Sometimes the recorders are on and sometimes they aren't. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, right on. So yeah, um, it was good. We we talked a bit about. IT, we talked about wellness, we talked about workplace Mm -hmm. wellness. And today, I think one, I would love for folks to get to know you a little bit. So maybe some origin story and sort of like all of that fun stuff. But then we've, uh, you know, we all know that we are all in the middle of a pandemic. And so we've been talking a little bit about, um, you know, IT teams and and how people are working these days and what people are using technology wise. And so we thought we'd have a chat about that too. But it does seem to have driven wellness to the forefront too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Microsoft Viva yeah, the, the announcements these past couple of days, although time shifting and stuff, but yeah, it clearly is a kind of consolidation of these ideas into uh, a sovereign app. And it's sort of a first per the first thing you should look at as you come into work uh, each day. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting to just sort of recognize that that's a thing that that that's how that should be done. Yeah, absolutely. I think when and it was a maybe ignite. I can't remember last. It was last time, maybe it was announcements about Headspace and, Mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of things being a part of uh, Microsoft's offerings as well. I mean, that's, I don't know, just even five years ago. not Yeah, no, I I would say (laughs) if you did it, it it was an accelerant. Yeah. Like, it seems obvious now that we were headed this way for a while, but the pandemic just crystallized a lot of ideas Mm. about how do we manage work and how do to folks work remotely and how do we sort of get to that? Uh, am I getting enough time for myself? Am I getting enough time to concentrate? Mm-hmm. You know, does this meeting make sense? Uh, yeah. it, does it actually move the ball forward? Like the, all right. of that tooling to have sort of have the tools serve us to make those choices correctly. Yeah. I mean, I tend, I, we've done a whole, we've talked about this a little bit, but like no meeting Fridays, you know, it's yeah. like, I'm, I'm trying to use Fridays for, ideation, creation, writing, podcasts, times. fun yeah. stuff like this. Um, and and I've gotten so that, that I've been very like, well, we do Focus Fridays. And then I have to realize I'm like, okay, who is it that I'm telling that? You know, like, <laughs> so like you know, am I, am I really uh, pushing back on someone I shouldn't be pushing back on? <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. And, and just sort of, uh, you know, that, they different it's it's interesting when you cross cultures on this too mm-hmm. right that different cultures definitely reacted to the pandemic in different ways yeah and have very different ideas about employee wellness and work and and so sometimes you suddenly realize you're speaking a completely foreign language to someone like they're looking at you like you have three heads mm-hmm. like, what 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 are you yeah. talking about yeah 
And, and it's also speaking of people who work in tech versus, you know, I have a really good friend of mine who is a um, captain at a Trader Joe's, mm-hmm. you know, and talking to him about what's been going on, you know, there for him at work, being an essential first line worker and all of that stuff. It's just, you know, it's it's different, you know, it's, yeah. uh, and, and what they're using for wellness and and how they're having that really became super forefront for them because if I not, think that's one of the stratifications we've seen is mm-hmm. when you have work that must be done in person, that there is yep. no other way to do it. Mm-hmm. What does that life look like? And what right. is your relationship to your company now and your, in your company's uh, supporting of your needs? Yeah. Cause you are running a different set of risks at that time. Absolutely. As opposed to the work that had a choice. And m- for much of us in technology, we've always had a choice about where we worked and how close, how far away. And mm-hmm. and so we, suddenly when the decision was kind of taken away from us, like you can't come here. Oh, all right. right well, we'll all figure that stuff out. That's yeah. just not optional for someone in retail. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, just, that's, that, that's not a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, um, I don't know. I, I, I was looking at and thinking about, uh, you know, I've got Power Platform on the mind these days yeah. uh, with my job bleeding community there um, as well. And it's one of those where I keep thinking about, I was I was thinking through, uh, I'm learning the technology because I'm my MVP, you know, for Microsoft was on the Office SharePoint and Teams side of things. Sure. And so, you know, I have not been as familiar with all this stuff. So like in, in drinking from the fire hose at the job and then, you know, also just like working on my technology skills, I'm up trying to upskill myself. Um, but also thinking about, you know, I'm not a developer. Um, uh, and, you know, but I'm, you know, if you do the marketing speak of the citizen developer. Yeah. Which I'm know. not a fan of that term. I, I know. I, it's yeah. very controversial actually. It, um, without a doubt. <sighs> Because we're all developers. Like, I can't yes. talk to an IT person now who doesn't acknowledge they're writing code and cares about source control. Yeah, that's true. You know, that, that's mm-hmm. just sort of come normal. Uh, certainly the power platform for me, positioning-wise with IT like a, and, and dev, because I spend time on mm-hmm. .NET Rocks as well. It's like, listen, right, right. ignore this platform at your peril. Like, don't be crazy. <laughs> yeah. A lot of us in development came in as domain experts mm-hmm. who took these rad tools of the day in the nine right. years of the early aughts and yeah. quote unquote ruined our careers, right? Suddenly right. your ability to do that automation <laughs> was more important than your domain specific skills. Right. Um, and I think this is a new generation of that, mm. that these, your main, the main thing you bring to the table when you set down the power platform is your domain experience, mm-hmm. right? And you learn the tool to automate pieces from your domain experience. Absolutely. And yeah. then, you know, for, for us in IT, then it's like, how do I put governance around that? How do I right. make sure that this is secured and it's mu- using data properly and they have the correct permissions and yeah. I can back it up and maintain it, like all of those sorts of things. And with dev, it's how can I extend this? How, you know, again, how can I make yep. sure they're using data correctly? Like they, they're all, they're all come become government's place, but let's face it, like we're never getting to the bottom of our to-do list ever, ever, <laughs> ever. So anybody who could take a few things off my to-do list, <laughs> right. I like that person. That I, person's I my friend. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love how it's everything that I've ever learned about SharePoint or Teams, uh, you know, OneDrive, all of that. It's like, and because it's we're surfacing so much yeah. in Teams from say Power Apps and other things, like it's, it's, it, it is great. It's great. You know, it's, it's, it's not, I wouldn't call it easy, but it's definitely easier than I thought it might be to like, every time I saw out. a successful SharePoint implementation over the past 20 yeah. something years, mm-hmm. when did it start? 2003? Goodness gracious. There's the same, there's one common theme and it's somebody in the field, some domain expert fell in love with the idea of it at the beginning of it and became <laughs> that content manager. You just yeah. drove the depth of it. Right. There's a reason that people go to SharePoint. It's because there's answers there. Right. Well, yeah. for us as implementator, implementators, we rarely provide the answers. We play, provide a place for the answers. Right. But there was somebody in that team who started mm. putting those answers in and that yeah. changed everything. Yeah. No, that's very true. Yeah. And so, And I feel like... What's happening with these low code, no code, you know, cloud centric implementations is that we're now taking advantage of the new tooling and resourcing we have to yeah. allow that content creator to surface more stuff and yeah. to create more focal points of knowledge for organizations. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I love all just seeing all the apps that are being created all over the place. Yeah. I just, it's super impressive, you know, but and I mean, people, and it's a proliferation problem, right? Like the yeah. conservative IT guy me is like, oh, I remember this was SharePoint, right? Where you're just literally yeah. hunting down SharePoint installations all over the place. <laughs> like it was some kind of disease, right? Yes. Like every machine in the sun had one. Right. And we, but I'm a, part of that is like, you kind of need to let the puppy run. Yeah. Right. Like there mm-hmm. needs to be a certain amount of madness. A, that's where you find some interest, but it's also right. how you get people charged up enough that, you know, don't rain something in before it lives long enough to say yeah. it needs to be reined in. Like that's a useful part of the process. Yeah. To go, okay, this is getting a lot. Of, I, you know, I get you guys all love this and you're having a great time. Let's see if we can't put a few parameters around what we do here. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I mean, it is, it was. And and at the time with SharePoint, it wasn't just that it was on the, on the like, uh, it was under the desk. <laughs> yeah, no, it was anybody's workstation, right? Yeah, right. You know, or, or they, I had guys who relit old workstations. Wow. Like stuff that was supposed to be taken away, we hadn't got around to picking it up and they powered it right. back up, threw a SharePoint implementation on it, stuck it under a desk. So you didn't even know that machine was there. And yeah. then you go pick it up. Like, oh no, you can't have that. That's running X, Y, Z. Right. What? And it's this running not something. your machine anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it's running something giant for the company. You know, one of my so. favorite variations on that particular theme, uh-huh. I got hired as a technical analyst for a company who will remain nameless. Okay. For a uh, fairly large, it was a fairly large company. They had these five major divisions, and one of the divisions it was just knocking out of the park performance wise. Like they were building yeah. all these great things, customers were super satisfied, the product was awesome, and so I was brought in as sort of the neutral third party to gather that story to sh- that would be shared internally with other teams about here's how you do things right. 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 This is how you excel. <laughs> and what were they doing? They shifted all their workloads to Amazon and not told anybody. Wow. Yeah. So why? And so the actual story was, how do you outperform in this company? Don't use internal IT. Wow. Great solution. But, and they literally didn't know, like, I'm the one who uncovered that little nugget, right? We finally sat down with the VP and it's like, you know, we started pouring through different things. I'm like, oh, an AWS in the equation. I had no idea that they had no cloud implementations in the company at all. Right. But as you sort of assembled the whole story and then I start talking around and eventually it comes out. It's like, oh no, we work internally only. Really? Wow. Well, let me tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to love this. This is a yeah, great yeah, story. Right. Let me, here's the case study. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, it was a great, but you know, and ultimately it's a great exemplar. It's like, is mm-hmm. IT an impediment to progress? Right. Right. Like, our, because ultimately we're in a service business. Yeah. We true. don't exist without the line workers. The line workers exist without us. They won't be as productive. Right. But you can get to a place where you're actually an impediment to the productivity. Mm. That's a problem. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. I, so speaking of a job that you've had in the past, mm. when when was your first dip into technology? Well, my father is an electrical engineer. Ah, uh, okay. So, okay. and he was building cash registers. Oh, wow. So my first memories of burning my fingertips are on soldering irons at like six years old. Oh, okay. Right. Like I'm literally a lifer in, in, and I, the funny thing is I forgotten that that's unusual in the sense that, because often people yeah. have only met me as the podcaster or as a developer and right. things like that, Right. but take something apart, repair, you know, replace a couple of opponents, solder back up again, not a big deal. Right. Like yeah. I've done that longer than just about anything else. Right. So I programmed his cash registers that were based <laughs> on an S80 bus when I okay. was eight. Wow. And so, and that was literally keypadding at speed, right? That's what that's what it took to do that. I met my first microcomputer at ten, and that was a TRS eighty Model One wow. at the local Radio Shack, which I had gone to to buy parts for an electronic rocket countdown timer. <laughs> Even at ten years old, I was that kind of lazy. Like saying five, four, three, two, one, way too much work. I want a display that does it for me. And then launches the rocket. So I'm in right. buying parts at the local Rad Shack, and that they just got the. This is like 1977. They got right. the one of the very first ones of those machines in, and I don't think I left that place for a month. Right. Like after school every day to tinker with that computer. Like it just sure. it had me instantly. And and they figured out pretty quickly mm. that if a ten year old's programming it when somebody else is is considering it, it's like, well, if the kid can do it, you can do it. So right. I was a pretty good sales tool almost immediately. 
<laughs> they just sat you in the front on a stool. Just let him do his, that's where I want to be anyway, right? <laughs> and as long as I'll get out of the way when they need to do a demo or something, I'm fine. And so at 12, mm-hmm. I worked for a company. Uh, I combined the two things. At 12 years old, I was working for a company called HNS Microsystems, long gone, uh, that serviced computers. And wow. so took those soldering skills and mm-hmm. the new programming skills. And so this is in the early days of personal computing. Yeah. Around 1979, 1980. Okay. Um, wow. We were doing upgrades to the TRS-80. So the original TRS-80 didn't come with lowercase, but you could buy a component set and add it to the board and that would add oh, you lowercase and memory expansions and things like that. Sure. And there, and there, most people thought they were more DIY than they really were. So mostly my job was to take a partially poorly installed lowercase kit and install <laughs> it correctly, right? right. Repair it. Or they burned a couple <laughs> of components and they overheated them, like something like that. Wow. So I did that. That was my first sort of real after school job mm-hmm. was repairing computers. And uh, so I've never, really never done anything else. Like, yeah, <laughs> I've, you're, you're a fixer kind of have more practice than everybody else like it's not right. fair right it's like listen i got here way first like yeah. i remember reading the specifications for the ibm pc in wow. 1982 sure. and going yeah this it runs cpm so it'll probably be useful because this ms dos thing is not going anywhere <laughs> that's not important <laughs> at all <laughs> yeah do you think do you think it's about being curious I, without a doubt, especially yeah. when you talk about an emerging technology, that's true yeah. in general. Yeah. I, I mean, it, I, it happens to be that computing has consumed the world. Like Mark Andreessen right. wasn't wrong, right? Software has eaten the world. Mm. But there were many, you know, I also fell in love with Dungeons and Dragons. And like, there was many sure. things that you could obsess over. Mm. If I'd been born in a different generation, I probably wouldn't like one of the ham radio kids. Like, right. Sure. I was uh, always interested in things, and this happened to be a thing that could become a career. Right. You know, not, uh, the real question you have to ask is, would you have stayed in computing if it mm-hmm. couldn't have become a career? Right. Because I didn't make a business out of rocket countdown timers. <laughs> so, you know, it's just the opportunity space was so huge. Yeah. And so part of it is the straight up luck of just being born in the right time. Mm-hmm. And then it happened to have parents who were never an impediment you know, I didn't have to fight my parents to be an obsessed computer kid, right? My father right. had always been in electronics. My, my mother was happy, you know, just do your things. And, you know, I probably should have been a physicist because I he always had a knack for that. Mm. But nah, computing ended up getting me and they never pressed back on that. So, you know, they, they, the joke is that many of us in this sort of geeky space were black sheep in our family. And that wasn't me. Mm. That, that was no, my family was all in. Yeah, yeah. I'm very fortunate. You know, you don't realize the difference in how you approach your work and your problems and so forth is shaped by those those earlier experiences. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for you, what do you what like as far as like learning, what what's your favorite kind of I'm a of reader. Learning? You're a reader. That's my superpower is that ah. I read I read very like people trying to figure out how I know so much. It's like mm-hmm. I read and I read fast. Gotcha. And I read constantly. Like it's my favorite. It's an easy thing for me to do. I consume the better part of 100 books a year. My wow. Kindle is just a constant machine. Like it's something I use all the time. Used to do it flying, not doing a lot of that these days. Yeah. But um, but that has always, when I look, again, it's sort of that reflective thing. You look back and go, wow, you know what? I, I was able to translate bad documentation into better things, right? Mm-hmm. Better articles, better podcasts, better whatever. Right. And so you, you're helping people just because you're explaining things in a way they can consume. Yeah. And that ultimately kind of stole my career away, right? Like, yeah. suddenly this, it was less and less important that I could program and more and more important that I could explain programming to others. Yeah, absolutely. So tell everybody, tell everybody about what you do right now. Like what's your, what's your day job? <laughs> yeah. What Jay? Yeah. That's a great question. I wish I knew. I'm still trying to figure out what I do <laughs> when I grow up. Uh, you know, the, I got gradually, I, I was in the right place at the right time with the dot-com boom and, and got involved. My strength was in web scaling in the early, early days, the mm. early 90s. Okay. I was always a performance tuning guy for computing in general, right? I'm the guy who made DCOM work at scale. Like that, mm. I worked on those kinds of problems. By the way, if you've ever played around with DCOM, you know that the, the truth is the D stands for dumb. <laughs> uh, and so as the web emerged as a force, 
the mindset of performance tuning, this, hey, every app has a choke point somewhere. The trick is to identify where it is and loosen that choke point, And then the choke point will mm -hmm. appear somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's just a never ending cycle of right. following the constraint around the infrastructure, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. I was never baffled by that. I had been doing that before it became so important. Mm -hmm. And so pretty quickly during the dot-com boom, I was a hired gun on the investor side for the financiers to go in and solve problems. Mm -hmm. So whatever the, and that experience of those late nineties into the early aughts really taught me that it's never that the technology can't do it, right? The technology, the question is why is this team struggling with it? Mm -hmm. What belief do they have? What interrelations do they have? Like what's the constraint that's get, that's struggling, having them struggle to get over that hump. So you know, I, I suspect that's when I actually ruined my career because there was a point where I realized, you know, I'm not really a technologist. I'm a marriage counselor, right? <laughs> like that's the pro the problem is the, the team, right? Like that, that's the actual issue is we're not uh, gathering facts and reacting to the facts, mm -hmm. right? You are dealing with a personality conflict. You're dealing with an a, a, a emotional issue. Like that's what you're dealing with. Yep. And Because if the facts are there, if you went and looked for them and if you deal with sure. the facts, you could fix it. Right. But the fact that every time I, I would be hired as a, as a, as a performance tuner, yeah. because that's socially acceptable. Hey, this guy specializes in, in tuning things. Mm -hmm. Right. And in reality, what you really do is look around the room and saying, you know, who's the impediment to this? Like, what's the real problem? Mm -hmm. Because you can always tune, you know, it doesn't take very, and the fun part is the truth is the moment you walk in the door, everybody knows what the problem actually is. Right. They're just happen to be wrong or they're not being listened to one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so it, then you sort of unpeel towards, and often, <laughs> you know, the, the mistake was you unpeel towards facts and you're in a situation where it's like the facts aren't actually important here. Yeah. The hierarchy is important. Like some other thing is important. And until you deal with that, the facts aren't going to fix it. Yeah. No, you're spot on. I mean, marriage counselor and and investigator kind yeah. of, I think, right? Both, which maybe is sort of the same thing, I guess. But yeah, I mean, I, I find that with, with teams too. It's just, you know, it's always it's always about human psychology. Yeah. You and know. how they relate to a problem, how they react to it, and how they're listened to, yeah, right? How how, how visible they are. It's mm -hmm. just different calibers of problem. What's harder or easier? Yeah. You know, often it, 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 you know, the easy one is the junior guy that's actually done the clever bit, but nobody understands that that's the clever bit. Yeah. Like I mean, if you just elevate that person and allow them to do their thing, and maybe they're not particularly good communicators or whatever's mm -hmm. put them in the box. The far more difficult one is the senior person who's wearing their scar tissue of past bad experiences as an impediment to the team. Like that's a tougher yeah. one to crack, yeah. but they're all crackable, right? If you, yeah. if, if you want to take the time and, and right. take advantage of your position as the external person, right? Yeah. Just sort of say, Hey, look, like, you know what normal is. You've seen a bunch of teams and you know, what's normal. There's dysfunction in the team. The question yep. is, do we know where the dysfunction is? And are we allowing right. it to stop us from being successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are people willing to acknowledge it or change it? Yeah. Or I think part of it is even just acknowledging it sometimes, you know? Yeah, well, it's 100%, like, right? Just, and that's the, the that's thing about being the outsider. It's like, hey, I'm kind of new here and I'm only going to be here for a week. So yeah. <laughs> you all know that's an elephant, right? Like I'm just, <laughs> he's kind of standing in the corner and everybody walks around him, but you never look him square in the eye. Am I wrong? Is that not an elephant? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, what, what we've been going through with working from home and all of that, like kind of circling back to our beginning of our chat, it's yeah. like, it's the, I, I just, I literally just bought a magnifying glass because I needed one. I've been doing some, I need to get a soldering iron because I want to fix a sports Walkman. <laughs> <laughs> Wait here, I'm going to show you because it's Cassette fun. I keep, or disc this cassette i love it yeah oh right goodness. so i i it was working and i opened it and then what had happened was is that batteries leak corroded like they're yeah. corroded and they corroded on one of the one end and i was like oh that's oh darn it and so i was like okay and then when i i was doing um because you use vinegar for that yeah a little by bi or bicarbonate soda you need a little yeah. acid 
yep. to convert the, the corrosion back. Too far gone. Yeah, and okay. Then the trace starts to collapse. Yeah. The piece, and it's the piece that hits the negative end of the battery. Right. And I was like, oh. So I went on eBay, of course, and of I went to see if they had one. And so they did. So I'm trying to figure out how to like fix it. But I feel like I still am going to need to solder something. And I haven't done that ever. It's possible. And I thought, but I was like, there's Why an not? incredible Walkman culture out these days. Like you might want to yeah. go get yourself an up revved Walkman. I know. To have that indulgent too. But it's fun to repair something. Like totally. To and this one was it. mine. Yeah. So, so it's vintage. Like yeah, it's important to you. Totally. Getting a new battery housing and it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Although I did, I also saw, oh, that's, it's Alice in Borderland. Have you seen that? It's a no. new series. It's a lot. It's kind yeah. of gory. It's a lot, but the, the one of the people in it like made a taser out of one of these, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, I have to." You what? It. Yeah, I know. It was kind of bizarre. I was just like, "Huh?" So yeah, I told you my nostalgia is hot right now. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, but yeah, I don't know. It is, but it is. We get back to people, though. You know, I think it always. Gosh, yeah. it it is, and that's something that I don't think. That's not something we're necessarily taught, you know? No, um, no. And even then, even when we are often taught wrong, awful lot right. of lore and sort of yeah. common sense is just not that common, right? Mm -mm. Yeah. The I line mean, I lean on is the old Mark Twain saying, it's not yeah. what you know, it's what you know ain't so. Right? <laughs> it's, it's that certainty around something that shouldn't be certain, that we serve each other really well when we poke at any of the certainties and go, are we really sure that's correct? Yeah. Like, are we really sure that you can't be productive from home? Are we really sure that an eight hour day is the right way to do this? Right. That the real measure of productivity is how much you type today. Mm -hmm. Like those yeah. certainties that, but that's how we've always done it. Like those are the things we mm. need to scrutinize. Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're right from a, on so many levels. I agree with you hundred percent. It's like, it, it's interesting being a consultant versus, you know, when you're inside a company or running oh, yeah. your own or whatever. And, you know, I think I have all flavors of that in my life right now. Um, well, but, you're, you're jumping in one of the largest companies in the entire world. And I think true. one of the reasons they wanted you there is that you are coming from that field perspective too. Because I think, yeah. I think my, there are more and more people inside of Microsoft that are very savvy to the bubbleness there is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it fascinating for the past year for the Microsoft employees that I know. It's like that because you haven't been on campus because they closed that campus in March yeah. of 2020. Mm -hmm. They're looking at their own company differently now. Yeah. Like, I think the bubble has changed for them, too. And that's yeah. really exciting. Like, yeah, it's always been a thing for them to connect with their customer. They do things that are very different than their customers do. So maybe they're starting to see that. I look at how rapidly stuff like Teams and M365 as a whole has evolved right. because they've depended on it in a very different way absolutely. than they've ever had before. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it, it's great to be a part of that motion, you know, yeah. and also ha having, you know, uh, even when I have worked at Microsoft or as a vendor, or, you know, all of those mm -hmm. things, I never really, I mean, I had an office years ago uh, on campus and that got, got booted um, when everybody kind of got booted off campus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, I haven't worked in an office since 2006, mm -hmm. uh, like my own home office, but not an office office. Yeah, or it's, uh, I, I wouldn't put me in an office. I'd fire me. I'm difficult. <laughs> I would not. Yeah. No, I'm not your of, guy for that. You want I've, me for maybe a week and then that's quite enough of that. that you're like, nope. Uh, yeah. I know there was a tweet that I can't remember who put that out, but asked, um, maybe it was Mary Rodriguez she, that I think maybe asked, you know, are you excited to go back to the office if and when? And it's been an interesting string of, you know, of absolutely not and yes and no and but like i miss people but i don't know if i miss people going to the office <laughs> well and it's part of this is because you haven't been for a year so yeah. there's a little nostalgia yeah. but you know it's the old never meet your heroes thing like yeah. that nostalgia is a distortion wait till you meet the reality <laughs> plus you've been sensitized to things you weren't sensitive anymore like yeah your commute you haven't yes. done for a year. Mm -hmm. Your new commute's going to suck in a whole new level. And then yeah. you're going to get to work and wonder, why am I so angry? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and the time that you're able to spend with family too, yeah. which is both wonderful and 
you know, <laughs> like, well, and that more interrupt yeah. based work where it's yeah. like, Hey, in the middle of the day, I can go do this thing, right. Yeah. That, that that's all flexibility and work a little later in the quiet times. Like those choices, when you can make them well are really yeah. powerful. So my big question will be, you know, as someone who's worked with and led with a lot of teams, it's like, how big of a productivity hit are we going to take? Totally. Now that you've gotten into the groove of this model and hit a new state of productivity, you know you're going to lose some when yeah. we change that model up again. Maybe you're doing a few more days a week in the office. Right. And is it ever going to, how long will it take to come back? Like, what will the new norm be? And it may not. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, and I've, I think for me, I've had an... I, because I work from home and that this has been my life, mm -hmm. I have, I've had an edge on that because I would get up and have my coffee and walk to my office in my house. Like yeah. I, I've been doing that for over a decade, you know? So I feel like, oh, well, yeah, I've always had sort of back-to-back -back meetings on team or, or whatever it was at the time, you know? And so I'm very used to that. And so I feel like, yeah, it's a big shift from, you know, the whole drive in, get a cup of coffee, sit down, maybe have a meeting, walk over here, go to the bathroom, you know, yeah. like all that stuff. Like in an office setting, do you get maybe four hours of actual work done? You're way maybe. more interruptible. And there's all that infrastructure to operate on, right? Right. The coming and the going and the, all the other rituals take more time. Yeah. But you're super connected to the people you work with in a different way, right? Yeah. How do you get that buzz? You know, yeah. the walking mm -hmm. down the corridor yeah, with all the offices full and it's that sense that there's things being happening, made, yes. you know, yeah. and our home offices are often a bit too quiet. And, uh, yeah. you know, that's, so I think we're manufacturing buzz these days, right? Mm -hmm. we, we are communicating more and we're yeah. doing ambient calls that are not specific, just so that we hear other people typing and that we're writing more newsletters and more bits to each yes. other that, that are the construct of buzz. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I agree with you hundred percent there. Yeah. It's, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, 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 I liked your comment about the the being a consultant and then being able to sort of pop in and be like, here's what I see. Yeah. You've actually paid me to do this. So I'm not, yeah. you know, and then, then you will eventually leave or you're not a part of it. I mean, I always felt like the mole a bit in my yeah. jobs with people too. Like they open up to you, they tell you different things that they would never, you know, and you're kind of a sounding board as well. And if, sure. you know, it's you're, like, you're interested, you're genuinely interested. You genuinely need to know. I mean, if you're good at your job too, yeah. Uh, and, and depending on the personality, I mean, there's a few guys where it's like, listen, dude, I'm here for one week. They're paying me a lot of money. They're going to listen to me this week. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to say? Right. You yeah. Know, what can I help you? You've get got good ideas that are not making it upstairs. Which one, you know, let me help you mm -hmm. get a couple up there. Yeah. Like while we have this chance. For sure. You know, yeah. and that's, it, again, it depends on the personalities you're speaking to as to whether mm -hmm. they, some people really relate to that meta. Right. When yeah, you take right. away the mystique of the consultant, it's like, no, I'm an outsider who charges yeah. a lot. And so they're going to need to show value for what they've paid me. Yeah. And that's going to be to respond to a few ideas. What mm -hmm. we've got to do right now is figure out which ideas that's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Right? That's yeah. the meta of that. And for some mm -hmm. people that works, it takes a lot of air out of a lot of dumbness around yeah. why is this consultant here? Right. I'm not here to say everybody needs to be fired. Although yeah. I've said that. No. <laughs> you know, that, you know, or big, simple things like these guys need more money for training. Like it's, it's not any more complicated than that, but right. I can write the document in a way that the folks that are paying me that will ultimately pay for that training will mm -hmm. go, Oh, I see why we need more training. Fine. Here's your budget. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're tra you're a translator. You're flipping mm -hmm. between the different languages. Yeah. I also find that this time of us being apart from each other has really, I mean, I, I, I am both uh, fully one part rogue and the other part by the book. Mm -hmm. I, it mm -hmm. is, it is, I, I love both of them and I interweave them. Um, and I have for a long time. And I find that certain people are, you know, on the spectrum of that, but they are usually sort of tend or trend to one or the other. Um, well, it's, and, a, it's a difference between process and dogma. Yeah. Yeah, right. Sir. So often processes are important. They make mm -hmm. sure people are included. They make right. sure we don't accidentally break laws, right? Like they protect us yeah. from errors that can be made. Right. The, in the difference between process and dogma is process you understand the value of and dogma you did not. Yeah. yeah so 100%. you become a rogue when you challenge dogma. Yes. 
And then yes. you turn around and, and support a process and everybody's baffled. But you were supposed to be the rebel. Yeah, but I'm not an idiot either. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Like, that's the balancing act. Totally. I always use the example of like, I love jumping off cliffs, but I really love it when there's champagne and a really big fluffy mattress at, at the, the end that I can bounce in on the bottom, you know? <laughs> and that's me and being in a bit few You went with me too, because what's yeah. the fun of falling by yourself? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's do this together. Yeah. But that's a, sort of an event planner, producer nature. Sure. I, think, uh, I have written the email where it said, I'm willing to run off the cliff with you guys. I just yeah. want you to acknowledge there's a cliff. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, yeah. so like, do we know where we're going here, mm -hmm. or are we just presuming? Well, they were going that way, so I'm going that way too, which is yeah. an easy state to get into, right? We do, mm -hmm. we are social creatures. We yeah. are part trying to be part of a process, right? Yep. And you hear those lines in organizations when the dogma gets too much robust, where we need you to be a team player here, and it's like I hear you saying, "Shut up and do what I say," right? Like. But, you know, we cha I challenge your dogma. Show me it's not. Show me it's a process with a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, that, that kind of cuts close to the bone for me, actually. <laughs> but, um, you know, good, wise <laughs> organizations bring people in yeah. to shake up that dogma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And I, yes. you know, I've worked with a lot of different teams at a lot of different companies where new leadership comes in on a particular group. And immediately have this question of, should this group be shut down? And everybody's up in arms about it. Right. right? And it's yeah. like, that is a really good assessment. Do we still have a purpose that is important to the organization? Because if we yeah. don't, maybe we should stop. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And so it's it makes sense for when a new person takes the helm, right? When you grab the wheel of the ship, question one should be, are we going where we want to go? Because mm -hmm. we're not, I'm stopping this thing. Like, let's, yeah. let's do something else. Yeah. But it's hugely threatening to those that get drawn into the dogma of, I just get to do my thing each day. Don't mm -hmm. change things. Like, it's unnecessary. Yeah. It's like, as, as long as it's still relevant, then sure. Yeah. And if it isn't, yeah. then let's do something else. Yeah. I, I think that the also just, we get so wrapped up in um our own well it's ego but it's also just who we are and mm -hmm. what defines us yeah you know um some people are really 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 defined by their jobs yeah you know that's well, and who also they are that they produce value and, they, yeah. and at some point in their career they were producing value and then they they grabbed onto that mm -hmm. and the idea that th those values shift I mean, that can yeah. be very disruptive you worked really hard to get good at this thing. The fact that that thing's no longer important, that's hugely offensive. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and you got to be kind to folks like that. Like, yep. you, how do I help you move forward? You know, yeah. Take those experiences and move on. Over on the dev side, the, we had a theme a few years ago, which is like, are those hard-fought scars you've got, mm. you know, symbols of wisdom mm -hmm. or an impediment to progress? You yeah, know, you you, right. you had a bad incident with a technology. You've never touched that technology again, and now you're actively stopping others from stopping that touching that technology. Are right. you saving them or are you holding them back? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, and I'm and and again, I find that I don't know, like I uh, in in so many things, it's it's like the it's like you you go for the French fries and the Coca Cola first. Yeah, you know. Like it's because one, they're yummy, but like, you know, like, yeah. although I haven't well, had a soda in pick like off years, the easy, but, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, pick up the easy, get the yummy parts first. And it's like, wait a minute. Um, okay. You want to do that? Cool. But maybe we should we'll talk about it for a second first, or, you know, somebody else or 16 other people are doing the same thing that you are. Yeah. Can we, can we all get together and do it? And then that person's like, well, that's my, my, that is my thing. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's like you, the, the two fellas at the Jetta, they look at the Jetta, they go and they run and one of them licks the Jetta, you know, handle. Yeah. And the other guy's like, what, Look, you know, and it's, we have that, it's, I don't know, the ownership and the yeah. individualism and the, you know, like I, I've, I have worked so hard for this. Yeah. But you worked you know? at, and it's like you're valuing the wrong thing. Our va our goal was to produce value for customers. Yes. And I get that this thing can mm -hmm. lead to that. Right. But there are other ways to provide value too. Yeah, absolutely. So, and can and we get together? And it, well, and, it, and often we hang on to those things for so long, they're no longer providing value. 
Mm. But I'm good at this thing. It's like, yeah, but the job was to be good at providing value. Yeah. Or I've, uh, this is my script. This is my recipe. I've made a plan. I'm running my script. I'm running my recipe. I'm getting good, good results. You know, there's no no more, no less, you know, it's good. It's all good. And then it's like, well, okay, that's cool. But you know, what's, what if you did one thing that's outside that bubble of innovation or try something new? And it's like, gosh, I remember I walked into a, a technology, no, what was it? It was a transportation company. And I said to them, I was like, hey, I'm here. And this is when I was selling some software that, you know, my company. And I was like, they had invited us because they wanted to find a better way to do training and everything. And Mm -hmm. I walked in this place and, you know, it was brown and it was all cubicles and gray and everything. And I was like, holy cow. And nothing against them in that because that's what they could have and whatever. But it was just one of those moments where it's like, and I talked to all these people and they were like, hmm. Yeah, it's really cool what you have there, Heather. We like it a ton and it's neat and all of that. But I don't know, like all of us on the team here, like we're very close to our pensions and all of that stuff. And the way we do it is actually fine. Yeah, it's close enough for us anyway. Yeah. And I was like, I was so defeated in that moment. I was like, I can't believe they don't want to do this. You know, (laughs) And it was... Well, and he realized like that's the conversation you kind of wanted to have at the beginning too. Well, right. (laughs) Like, why am I here? Yeah, you know, (laughs) yeah, kind of. And I was like, maybe that was my fault. But it was just one of those moments of like, but I think that's also uh, in in teams and in small groups and whatever, when you're you're working on projects and stuff like that. And maybe that's that's one of the lessons is that... Mm -hmm. Why are we here? Are we all on the same page for this? Why are we all at the table? What yeah. do we bring to it? And can we craft something together? You know, I think that's my na- my theater collaboration nature. Too, yeah. But, Be- well, and the great thing about theater is you make things on a routine basis, but the transient, you're going to yeah. have to make it again. Mm-hmm. But there's a delight in that, right? Yeah. And the, oh, that, yeah. the product's only good when all of us execute well on it. Yep. And yeah. so, and that's, it turns out that's true for most things. It's just theater because of the transientness of the creation. Yeah. It's absolutely apparent when we're having a good day or not. Yeah. Right. Where, you know, when the deliverable comes quarterly or annually, yeah. you can have a whole bunch of bad days before it shows up at all on mm. what, what is ultimately delivered. And often we're so abstracted from the net deliverable, especially working in technology where we're almost yeah. never the line interaction. We're never interacting with the customer. We are supporting the people that interact right. with the customer. And so you get removed from the value proposition of the company. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. It's like, let's put up a show, you know? Yeah, let's go make the thing and stand in front of the people that are going to clap, mm-hmm. right? That are actually, yeah. and are going to pay. Yeah. And I, you know, you think about how much organizations benefit when we take someone typically in that staff role that's been in the back and send mm-hmm. them out on a customer meeting with some others. Oh yeah. You know, just like that it. moment where you, you know, I was making a product years ago that uh, improved performance of websites and we mm-hmm. were taking devs and adding them to the system integrator group. Like right. you do a quarter as a dev with the system integrators, go see them, put the product on site, mm-hmm. deal with the customer issues. Yes. And, and, and every dev that came back is like, wow, a, their job is really hard. <laughs> and B, we need to make some things to make it easier for them to do that. Because oh, if yeah. we can't deliver the product, nothing else matters. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I really, I do. I'm a big proponent of whatever business you're in or whatever. There's your internal community, right? That That is your business. And mm-hmm. it is a community, right? It's an ecosystem or community, whatever you want to call it. But it's it's your the people that you work with day in, day out at a business, say, right? And then there's your external community of people who are your customers or partners and all of that stuff. And I think that like when you're not healthy internally yeah, and working together and understand that most of any situations, issues are around all of our humanness. Yeah. You know, like how can you build community outside if you can't get it together on the inside? Yeah, or I love it's doing false. those, those you know? cross-team things where the main yeah. thing I'm looking for coming out of those cross-team moments is each of them coming out going, wow, their job is hard. Mm-hmm. Just that respect yeah. that every part of delivering value to an organization, to, to a customer is hard work. 
yeah, and, and is essential to the process. Yeah, and and I think right now when we're away from each other too and not so together, I, I at a company I worked for, I came in as head of marketing and I was working with my marketing team. And we were talking about, we were writing certain things and all of that. And there was a thing about support, like how do we get, making sure that there's good support. And I was like, and and I don't. Somebody made a dismissive comment about it, mm-hmm. and I was like, "What do you mean? Support's so important. Like they're the front lines. They're the yeah. first people. You know, like yeah, maybe there's a sales person that's the front line for a big, but but the support people are just as important to me as sales. They're the you ones know, who make the sales stick. Yeah, and they, make keep, sex, they keep second sale. Salesperson only gets to sell to you once. Exactly. Support yeah. will sell to you every day. Yeah, and so I was like, I it really, I was like, I can't even, and I said do you even know the people who work on support at this company? And they all like looked at me and I was like, and I, and I was like, okay. I was like, you know what? I was like, they're right over there. Yeah. And they were like, what? And I said, they over there. I'm like, get up. And everyone was like, what? And I was like, get up. And they were like, okay. And everybody, I was like, come on. And I walked over and I was like, Hey, support. And I said, sorry if I'm interrupting. Hey. And they all looked at me like I was bananas and they were like, yeah. And I said, have you ever met the marketing team? And they're all like, nope. And I said, okay, I'm going to buy everybody lunch. Let's do this. And they yeah. were all like, is it, and I was like, who needs to stay on? Stay on your headsets. Okay. You know what I mean? But it was an impulse. Worry, I'll have pizza had. delivered to you. Yeah, I know. I was like, I had an impulse, but I was just like, wow, like you have, how can we be working together on yeah, the same how thing? How can we be good? Well, you and know, they also, the bigger part is, you know, each group trivialized the other's job. Totally. Yeah. And that's the real toxic when you, when you don't have visibility at all, like you talk about these separations and so forth, is bit by bit, your problems are the only things you see and yeah. not, there are no other problems. Everybody else yeah. has it easy. Mm-hmm. And that it becomes insanely toxic. Yeah. It supports one of those, you know, one of the things I looked at being a technical consultant is the support organization becomes a training ground. Like most mm-hmm. of your, many of your best people in tech will come from support. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Because they touch the product like the customer touches the product. Mm-hmm. They've, and they know the real problems that they're faced. And then, yeah. and folks that excel in that, you yeah. know, they really get that, become really great uh, Absolutely. product owners, become great domain experts. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you see these organizations where they're, they're constantly bringing their, you know, it's like I can never fully staff support because as soon as they get good, the other rest of the company steals them wherever yeah. they may go, right? <laughs> like yeah. that's a, a great marketing resource is a, a knowledgeable support person. Right? They Absolutely. know so much. Yeah, they're full of the stories of the company. Yeah. They, they are. I mean, support people, like they should be the ones that you interview for case studies. Sure. They're the character stories too. The yeah. stories that didn't go smoothly. You wouldn't right. call support because everything's good. No, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. My one of my favorite interview sources for micro, for for Run As Radio are the Microsoft Premier Field Engineers. Oh, sure. Yeah. The yeah. PFEs. And they're mm-hmm. and they're being moved around again, which is but they're like a secret source of truth because they yeah. fought many of the hardest problems. Like, yeah. For me as a as a show creator, as a story creator, is to mm-hmm. find someone who's dealt with two million active directory entries and right. talk about what they did to make it work. <laughs> Not that I think you're gonna have two million active directory right. entries, but once you've heard the story, you're five thousand, you're gonna be okay. Don't you worry. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It just it gives you a sense of the depth of here's there the, there's a lot you know there's a problem up there your problem's going to be okay yeah no absolutely yeah no i i i agree it's it's one of those interesting things where it's like i don't know like at the end of the day for me it's about it, all of this stuff always comes down to humans and how we relate with each other yeah. and all of that and and maybe us all going through this really really intense time together I don't, you know, it's been a hundred years, you know, there's been all kinds yeah. of things that have happened, but not collectively as a global thing, you know, that we're... Yeah, we invented a whole lot of more medicine than we had a hundred years ago. That's <laughs> for sure. We, yeah. we have the possibility to save a lot more lives, but yeah. you also have to do the things too, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. it, it's fascinating to me to see the news stories from 1918 of yeah. the anti-mask movement. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah. in some ways, a hundred years on, we haven't changed that much. No, we have no, we have not. And and what was happening politically and what was happening social economically as mm-hmm. well, it's sort of 
Yeah, human beings were wired a certain way. Yeah, you know, we it's, definitely and it's evolved. hard to fight those tendencies. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right? And, it, and I'm firm, firmly in the camp that our tools are simply amplifiers of our behavior. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you're looking for a justification to fight against the system. We have more tools than ever before to get that justification. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've got, we've got all of those things at, at our at our beck and call if we choose to use yeah. them. Yeah, I've been. I, I joined. Um, somebody sent a, a join for Clubhouse for me. Mm. It's a, the new deal, and I yeah. went on. And it like I went on and I I didn't I I didn't know what it was and I went on and I was like I was holding my phone like this because I was like uh, I just worked out and like all this stuff I was like is this am I on the is it the camera and is it on like I don't even know if I'm on you know I was laughing and and a friend of mine I hear her, she's like hey and I was like uh hi what and she's like oh yeah welcome and I was like okay what? And she's like, Hey, you should come over here. And I was like, okay. And it was just this re- weird, random thing. And, and I actually haven't been on it since. Um, I keep seeing things pop up, but I've been, I'm so busy that I haven't been able to have the moment to like go in there and like, but it's just, you know, it's like you walked across the club for once. Totally. Like, well, that was a lot. Yeah. Do I want to go across the floor again? <laughs> no, and I feel like I'll dip into it when I have a moment, but it was yeah. one of those things that no, I was I, like, I, I need to gird my loins before yeah. I go up there. Well, again. and just make sure like I'm not like on or the camera or the thing. And I was like, yeah. oh, it's only audio. Okay. But then it's on mute. And then I was like, my, my boyfriend and I were talking and I was like, I hate just hang on a second. <laughs> just like, I don't know. It was so funny. But That's yeah. Funny. Yeah. The invi- I've got the invite in my inbox. I just haven't clicked on it yet. Yeah. That's one of those funny, like it's one of those things. Shiny new toy, squirrel. Yeah. Got a lot of toys around me. Thanks very much. No, I know. Then, okay. That was I know. I was like, one more thing. I was like, wait a minute. Should I TikTok this? Should I do? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's funny. Hey, you know, I wanna, um, I wanna ask you. I always ask everybody, and mm-hmm. um, and we've been talking for a bit now, which I have yeah. really enjoyed. So thank you again, um, for the talk. It's. This really is not for you. anybody who's listening. It's like, listen, this is not any different than how Heather and I talk when we get to talk to each other, <laughs> whether the recorders are running or not. This is the same thing we did on Run As. Like, yeah, we just talk. Totally. Kind of what? Do, what do you think about blah? Or yeah, so, and off we go. Right? Yeah. Every time. But I want to talk. I want to ask you my my question about. Um, so I love talking about sparks, mm-hmm. and and moments in in our lives that um uh move us and um if there was one that you could pluck out of the ether that you would share person place thing book whatever um that really seats you in who you are in this moment yeah today i mean there's a bunch of them right? sure. and, and as a yes. professional storyteller like i've told variations on this yeah uh i'm re- like reading seven habits for the first time mm. utterly okay. changed my career Mm. just consciously acknowledging that how you manage yourself, how you interact with others, you know, how you separate in the concept of leadership and management of your career. Like yeah. there's so many things that resonated there. Um, I, and I was super fortunate early on in my computing career that I, my, one of my mentors who ended up being a business partner mm. had a, was an older man uh, with an accounting background who pushed me on ROI. Mm. When I okay. when I was a twenty something and should have just been yeah. in love with the technology, the, mm-hmm. he made me angry about it. But like I had the <laughs> ROI thing hammered into my head right. so early on now, mm. and, you know. And I used to be angry with him when we were drawing up agreements, you know, contracts that were all about the negative things, all about stuff going wrong, right? And now in my fifties, like I'm that guy going, no, right. no, we have to work. The contract's only going to be important when things go wrong. So let's sure. go deal with how we're going to cope with things going wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, what detonated my career more than anything was that second child being born. Mm. You know, I remember sitting in my office working, you know, as an, as an IT guy and, and I like my work, but it's like, you have that moment as a male in the Western world. It's like, well, let's see, you're married, got a mortgage, two kids in a vasectomy. What do you do now, Batman? Right? Like, and it's like, uh, you provide for your family. And I remember yeah. just looking around the office going, I can do better than this. Mm. Right. That you just yeah. said, I, and it, it was only when I had a family that I was motivated to really press. What can I do more? Mm. Right. That that was sure. the catalyst for me. Yeah. And I was kind of comfortable just plunking away until yeah. I, it's like, no, no, you can do more. Yeah. 
you can provide I kinda, better. You decide to, I, I don't know, you, you decide to do the work. Yeah. And not, well, and not, not the work, like a job work, but the work of you. Yeah, the lead, and I think it's really a leadership work. I am going yeah. to consciously direct my career, not take mm-hmm. the next job that comes right. along. But no, what do I? Where do I want to go in my career? What do I want to do with these things? Mm-hmm. Make some goals and fight for them. Yeah, and then when those ones land, then make another set of goals and fight for them. And then it's you know you sort of I and I consciously remember a point where it's like, well, that's what I was I was hoping for, and I've got that. Can you think bigger now? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. What's the next set of goals? Absolutely. I mean, and that's that's and that the book everybody that you that. Uh, Richard was mentioning is the seven, the seven, seven habits, habits of highly effective of people. Highly Stephen effective Covey. people. Stephen Covey. Yeah, yeah I think very it's a great old. Book. It's, it's a very a old long, book, long time. Yeah. but it's one on the, point. One of the originals, especially for modern thinking, and still, I think you know, it stands the test of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I do the career-related talks, I always include seven habits. Mm-hmm. Then I then I go to Drive by Daniel Pink, specifically because mm-hmm. I'm typically mm-hmm. talking to technical audiences, sure. and I think. The technical audience needs to understand that money is as toxic as it is beneficial in the career. Yeah. That there is a point once the basics are covered where yeah. what matters is autonomy, uh, mastery, and purpose. And if yeah. we don't have those things, no amount of money is going to make you happy. Yeah. Right. And and when you look at how our technology careers work, the fact that we do volunteer off hours to do, you know, in the development world, it's open source projects. Like, wait a second, yeah. you're going to work all day writing code, and then at night for fun, to feel good about yourself, you're going to write more code. <laughs> yep. Really? Yeah. It's like, turns out yeah. wasn't the code part, right? It was the autonomy, yeah. mastery, and purpose part. Mm-hmm. And then the, the last book uh, that I refer to routinely is The Power of Full Engagement, which is mm-hmm. this, we all have the same amount of time. The only thing you actually get to manage is your energy. Yes. And when you, and when you manage your energy well, time's just not a problem. Yeah. So, and that's you knowing you. How do you recharge your batteries? How do you refocus your work? When do you need to take breaks? Yeah. And how do you, what do you, when do you acknowledge that you're working on something that isn't important to you and you should stop? Yeah. You know, those are those, all, those are hard decisions to make, yeah. but you know, you can play the game of time management all day long. It's just a game. The mm-hmm. energy management is what matters. Yeah. No, you touched on, we touched on that in our last talk, talking mm-hmm. about engagement in time. And I really love that concept. I, I do. I often say that we don't get time, energy, or good health back. You know? Yeah. No, um, you, you, you got to fight for them, right? Yeah. The, the time's the permanent one that, that is tough. The trick is mm-hmm. using your time effectively, but that's not yeah. by managing time. It's by managing energy. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like we get so wrapped up in a moment you know, we were just talking about moments or things that, you know, spark us. It's like I, the uh, even just thinking about this week, you know, the amount of energy I gave to certain things, uh, both say personally and work, mm-hmm. you know, like what, what out of those made me happy? What was a waste of time? What was something where I brought value or was effective yeah. or gave myself a moment to breathe? And that, and the purpose part is important. Like I'm mm-hmm. definitely at a place in my career where there's a bunch of things I'm really good at mm-hmm. that are even profitable and valuable to others, but they're just not that important to me anymore. Like I'm different mm-hmm. now. Yeah, and yeah. so I'm going to put less time into those things. Like I'm big on, I don't put energy into things I don't want more of. Yeah. Because when you, you know, when you're good at what you do and you put energy into things, you are going to get more of that. Is it something you want? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really... Excellent question and comment. Maybe maybe we should end on that. <laughs> I like that idea. But say it again because it's so good. I'm not going to put energy into things I don't want more of. Yeah. We may. Did we end on that in the last podcast? Because I loved it so much. I can't remember, I but I feel so. like... I think, I think we already stopped recording by then, but Mary? we definitely <laughs> talked about that, right? Because <laughs> for me, it's an email discipline. Mm. people ask me questions all the time and there's a lot of answers I want to give. Right. I'm also very conscious of the idea of if I answer this can, the question quickly, you're going to ask more questions. Do I want more of these? Right. If I don't, I'm not going to be a path of least resistance. I'm not going to leave you hanging either. Right. But if the easy, if I'm actually easier to use than Google, I'm making a mistake. 
Oh yeah. That's not good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it's, it's sort of like, uh, we talked about where you're going to people Richard it or they Heather it, like they Google it. Right. <laughs> yes, and we've become exactly. a verb. Right. Um, for sure. But yeah, but that energy thing I think is so huge. And so yeah. there are energy vampires out there Sure. and, and n- not even of their own fruition, you know, yeah. and, and I'll press back on that. I had a friend for a long time who would send me a link to a video. Mm-hmm. expecting me to dismantle it for him and, and give him a, a position on it. I'm like, unless you're preparing, unless you present a position with this video, I'm not watching it. Mm. Like, forget it. I want you to show that you care enough about this to actually have thoughts before you ask me to put energy into it. Right. It should at least be equal. Yeah. Right. I'm probably, I may think about it more than you. I may spend more time on it than you. But the fact that you've only sent me a link, I don't think you've looked at it at all. Well, absolutely. And are we enabling bad behavior yeah. and being an accomplice in just people not being, just being random? Not thinking you know? critically, right? Yeah. It's like, hey, if you want me to work with you on some critical thinking, I'm in, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But I'm not going to, you know, diagnose stuff for you. you yeah. Know, I will share in your critical thinking, but yeah. I think critically a lot. Mm-hmm. And Maybe enjoy why it. you're asking me, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, but absolutely. I, if this is a solution to you not thinking critically, I'm not supporting that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as I like to say, shut it down. So. <laughs> Just let that go. When you want to do some work, I'll work with you. But, so. but if not, I don't hire a trainer to watch the trainer do the workout. <laughs> right. That's, that's yeah. Not yeah. The point. That's that's true. You kind of got to get in there. So yeah, that was kind of the point. Actually, <laughs> do the work. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to take us to the, I'm going to take us on home. Take us take to us home, Ada. What a hey, ride. Uh, Richard, thank you so much. Such a pleasure. And just it's, a ton of fun to, yeah. to chat with you. It's a luxury to have a whole hour to just chat with you. Well, I think we happily give that energy to each other. So I think we do. Yeah, yeah sure. absolutely. Awesome. Well, everybody, that was Richard Campbell, who is the host of Run As Radio and a uh, goodness, tech maven, life maven. All kinds of mavens, I think, in there. Um, appreciate your time. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, folks, that was another episode of the Mavens Do It Better podcast. And here is to another beautiful day on this big blue spinning sphere. Thanks so much. The original music on this podcast was created by Jesse Case. <laughs>